Well, thank you, JSB. What a, what a wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, most most appreciated. I'm I'm delighted to be here uh, today and this week. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, let me tell you how delighted uh, I am. That is actually my street uh, in Ann Arbor, uh, taken uh, just a couple of days ago, and a picture is indeed uh, worth a thousand words. I have a preamble to this talk, and I thought it was so important to get the preamble right that I want to read it to you because I think it does capture why I am so excited about giving this talk to this audience on this day. Uh, I believe that people are drawn to ideas that reflect imagination and vision. Uh, frankly, there's a lot that is done in my field of health informatics and health information technology that doesn't get people excited. So up until recently, the field of health IT has lacked such an idea that reflects imagination and vision, an idea that would unite all stakeholders and attract the brightest minds from a range of disciplines whose uh, ideas and creativity are absolutely essential if we are going to be successful in achieving what, as you'll hear in a moment, we must achieve uh, in this nation. By the end of this hour, I hope to convince you that this concept of the learning health system is that key idea, reflective of imagination and vision that I hope will engage all stakeholders and attract the brightest minds from a range of disciplines. So we basically have a two-course menu today. Uh, the, the, uh, the first course will seek to establish this concept of the learning health system, uh, why it's needed, and uh, I will also describe much of what is happening across the country, reflective of the fact that this concept really is uh, capturing uh, the imagination uh, of the entire nation, certainly of uh, many, many people in, in healthcare. It was recently called the project of our generation by a very uh, respected uh, person in the health information technology uh, area. The second course of the menu, there we will change gears a little bit. I will make a distinction between the first system, which we might realize as a consequence of a number of activities that are already underway, and a high functioning system, the system we ultimately need, and the system that I think we are going to need your help, the help of the Hicks community to create. So first, the plight of the nation's health system. Uh, stare at this picture for a minute. This is another picture that's worth a thousand words. And if you haven't noticed, uh, the United States, in a plot of life expectancy against healthcare expenditure uh, per capita, is a significant outlier. We're over there, uh, if, you, if you hadn't noticed. Uh, this is not a good situation. We spend too much and we get too little. Uh, playing this out in words, Mr. Clinton, uh, just before that picture was taken, uh, gave a, an address at a meeting where he made the point no fewer than five times that spending 18% of our gross domestic product uh, on health is completely unsustainable. Making it even worse, there was widespread consensus that 30% of that very, very large expenditure is unnecessary. It is not deriving uh, any value whatsoever. We should be ashamed that we are 40th, that's 40th, not 4th, 40th in the world among nations in infant mortality, and there are three nations that have an infant mortality rate that is one-third as high as ours. Uh, there's a new estimate doubling the former one, now suggesting that over 200,000 people per year die in hospitals as a result of medical errors. So the system is unsafe, in addition to being inefficient. And last but not least, we rank last or next to last among five developed nations in five key indicators of uh, a high-functioning health system. Getting a little bit closer to what the learning health system can do, we're flying blind. 
We can't monitor our system in real time. This graph, which is a plot of rate, the incidence of myocardial infarction, heart attacks, against time, had we been able to create it, would have shown us in 1999 that something happened. Recall that we were not able to make this graph because we are flying blind. And in 1999, Vioxx was put on the market, the whole family of drugs called COX-2 inhibitors, and that we know now uh, greatly increased the incidence of heart attacks in this country. But it took us five years to discover that without what I'm going to, in a moment, speak of as a learning health system, a system that could generate this plot in real time. So to conclude my description of the state of the US healthcare system, it is the Titanic headed directly at the iceberg. And we need to turn to port. We need to turn to port quickly. And we need to figure out how to do that. Second point, the vision of the learning health system. Enter the learning health system. This figure of a learning health system is not an architecture schematic. It's a vision diagram. But I think it is very useful in portraying what the learning health system uh, is. There are many ways of thinking about the learning health system, and this is only one of them, but it's probably the best place to start. So if you stare at this uh, diagram a bit, you will see that the learning health system is multi-stakeholder. It basically involves all the stakeholders in our health system. Uh, it is decentralized, thus the cloud containing most of the kinds of functionality that a system of this type will have to undertake. It is reciprocal. It is two-way. The stakeholders who participate in this system will put something in and they will get something out. And the system, in, in functioning in a decentralized way, will, in order to be successful, need to be governed. It will need to engage and win the trust of the general population, what we call patients. And it will need to be able to undertake sophisticated analyses and disseminate the results of those analyses uh, back to stakeholders who are interested in the results. Another way of looking at the learning health system that's a bit more focused is that it enables so-called virtuous cycles of study, learning, and improvement. This is how the learning health system can turn the Titanic, helping us to figure out how to realize better health care, better health, safer at lower cost. If you look at about uh, 7 o'clock on the diagram, you will see that these cycles begin with the assembly of data relevant to a problem, leading to the analysis of that data. And this data can come from anywhere in the system. The interpretation of that data, which converts it into knowledge, feedback of those results of that knowledge to the relevant stakeholders, leading to change, whatever the knowledge suggests they might do to improve their circumstances will probably lead them to change, which will then lead to the next round of the cycle. Assembly of data about how well that change worked, analysis of that, and through successive iterations, improvement over time. Let me give you a more concrete example. A major problem in our health system right now is that people in nursing homes fall far too often. And when they fall, they break their hips, they break other things, and this is catastrophic, uh, particularly for elderly people. So let's suppose we wanted to use this learning health system, which doesn't yet exist, to improve health by reducing the rate of falls in nursing homes. Well, this process would begin by some group of stakeholders coming together and deciding to use the learning health system to study falls and, and diminish the rate. So they would assemble data on how nursing homes are currently preventing falls and what their fall rate is. They would then analyze data from across all participating entities and understand what practices associate with lower fall rates. 
that would then interpret these findings. Are these results credible? And what advice on the basis of these results uh, should be given? Then feedback. Advice would be given specific to each nursing home based on its own performance record and the knowledge accumulated about what practices reduce falls, what each particular nursing home might consider doing in order to reduce its own fall rate. In other words, this is personalized or customized, individualized feedback. Then each nursing home would decide whether to change its current practice in whole or part, and then the cycle would repeat to see if, in fact, the change practice worked and onward through successive iterations. Another key factor and feature of the learning health system is that it is a single infrastructure platform. You can think of the learning health system as the health infrastructure that the country doesn't yet have. And that this is one platform underlying and supporting a number of these virtuous cycles, each addressing a different problem, uh, which can be uh, ongoing simultaneously at, at any given time. The different circumferences of these cycles suggest that these uh, different virtuous cycles can involve different numbers of participants. Some of them can be bigger, reflecting the fact that they'd have more stakeholders and entities participating, and others could be smaller. Then the number that participate would depend on the nature of the problem. So falls in nursing homes is just one example. What are some other things that a high-functioning learning health system might make possible? Well, first and foremost, and this has become kind of an anthem uh, among uh, folks who are wanting to see the learning health system be realized in this country. It is widely believed now that the gap between the creation of new biomedical knowledge and its widespread implementation in practice can be as much as eight, 17 years, and that is clearly uh, unacceptable. With the learning health system, we might reduce that 17-year latency to 17 months or maybe 17 weeks, or in the case of a public health emergency, maybe even 17 hours. Think about what might be possible if we have the entire health system wired together so that we can understand in real time what is happening across the system. And this is what is possible if we realize a learning health system. Now more specifically, looking, th looking at the examples in this slide, as we enter an era of personalized medicine, personalized healthcare, where the dosage of a drug that each patient receives is not the same, but rather computed out of 10 or 100 or 1,000 variables that are characteristic of that individual. With a learning health system, we could actually learn over time through the actual experience of patients across the country on this drug, what is the best dosage? And we can tune that over time in the sense of machine learning and in the feedback component of the learning health system, the current optimal dosage, as it changes over time, could be automatically implemented nationwide in electronic health record systems. So at any given point, every patient is getting the best dosage of this medication for them. During an epidemic, new cases of whatever disease is the focus of the epidemic could be reported in real time using the learning health system and aggregated so that the spread of disease is not only known, but using well-established models can also be uh, predicted. And what we can do with the feedback side of the learning health system is feed back to each individual clinician, wherever he or she is, when that epidemic is expected to arrive on that person's, on that clinician's doorstep. And since these epidemic diseases often mimic other diseases. This is very, very important to help clinicians make accurate diagnoses of whether the, whether the condition a patient has is that disease or a mimic of that disease. And third, and perhaps most important, is the patient empowerment scenario of the learning health system. If a patient is facing a difficult medical decision, the learning health system could have a patient's like me button which basically says, find other patients who are very, very similar to me, again, matching on multiple 
uh, hundreds, perhaps, of characteristics and find out, as a consequence of what decisions they made about how to care for their conditions, worked for them and what, therefore, might be a best decision uh, or course of action for them to make. Now, as we think about how the learning health system capable of doing those things might evolve, uh, let me say something that comes out of my former experience in the government, uh, and that is that we do have a, in, an increasing quantity, the raw material for this rudder that is going to turn the Titanic. Our health system is going digital. Slowly but surely, more and more of the documentation of actual care delivered to patients is ending up in digital form. We have a long way to go with regard to standardization of this and integrity of this data uh, is, is, is a big issue, but we are moving what is non-computable because it is on paper to a computable digital form in increasing numbers as is seen uh, in this slide. Another important feature of the learning health system is, goes back to that notion of a single platform underlying a range and variety of these virtuous cycles. The learning health system is one infrastructure that supports a number of different activities. Research, public health, quality improvement, consumer engagement, all of these things. Uh, I have a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge there because it's uh, it's, it's edifying to remember that when they built the Brooklyn Bridge, they built one bridge to support trolleys, pedestrians, bicycles, and horses and buggies. They didn't build four bridges. They built one for all four. It's very important that when we build the learning health system as a kind of Brooklyn Bridge infrastructure for our health care system, we build one bridge to serve all of these purposes. Now, the learning health system is currently being envisioned in a lot of different ways, but some features that seem to be common to all of the visions of it is, first of all, it's that it's a data federation. No one is, and I want to repeat this, no one is envisioning the learning health system as one grand central database with all the health information in the country in one place. I don't think I have to tell this audience what folly that would be, and, and that is not being considered. Uh, by anybody. It does, as I mentioned before, have to be grounded in public trust and patient engagement. There needs to be the right level of participatory governance. We have to figure out how to govern this. And um, in the sense of the concept advanced by the uh, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute uh, several years ago, it, it, it is going to have many of the features of what is called an ultra-large scale system. And, and I'll come back to that. Uh, final point about this introductory excursion into the learning health system is that you can think of it as a fractal, and the fractal property of the learning uh, health system is both very interesting and very important. Whether it is at the level of a single hospital, you can think of a learning hospital, or a single healthcare delivery system like the Mayo Clinic or the Veterans Administration, or at the level of all the healthcare delivery in a state or region, or at the level of the entire nation, or even as is actively being discussed now at the level of the entire world, the challenges of making a learning health system work are pretty much the same at any level of scale. And, and this has many corollaries to it, one of which is that one way we can think about realizing a learning health system at a next level of scale is to think about federating the learning systems that exist at the next level of scale down, and that is a plan that is being uh, actively entertained as how we might realize a system, a system at the national level. So now at this point, you are probably thinking, uh, who is this guy? Uh, uh, I, I thank JSB for, for that introduction. You know quite a bit about me, but is this guy just saying these things as a matter of his own belief, or do other people believe what I'm telling you? And what I want to do now is reassure you that there is a growing movement uh, as this 
concept of the learning health system is increasingly capturing the imagination of the nation and becoming, in many people's minds, an absolute imperative, the project of our generation. So the U.S. Institute of Medicine has a whole series of reports. They have some, something called the Learning Health System Series, two reports of which I am showing you here on this slide. Each of these reports reflects the input of hundreds of people. In a recent editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine by a well-known uh, health policy expert, uh, Arnold Milstein, he wrote, U.S. healthcare needs to adopt new work methods outlined in the Institute of Medicine's vision for a learning health system. And this is in a commentary outlining what he considers to be three essential steps necessary to safely limit healthcare's GDP footprint, that 18% statistic. I referred to earlier. The learning health system is part of official federal policy. The goal of advancement of rapid learning and technological advancement is the pinnacle goal just under the transformation of healthcare in the 2011 still um, in force federal health IT strategic plan. And we are making progress toward what I'm going to call a first version of the learning health system. What does this progress look like? Well, there are so-called learning islands. There are entities, organizations, that within their own organizational boundaries, however those boundaries are framed, have become learning organizations, are doing the things I talked about, can support these multiple virtuous cycles, such as the nursing home example I just gave you. And some examples of these include uh, the Geisinger uh, Organization in Pennsylvania, the Mayo Clinic, which I've mentioned previously, uh, the, the Veterans Administration, which by becoming a learning organization has literally over the last 15 or 20 years gone from worst to best in healthcare uh, in this country, and Kaiser Permanente, which is actually the organization that detected the problem with Vioxx and did the country an enormous favor by being a learning organization that could do that detection is another example I would call out as a learning island. Then perhaps even more interesting is the rise of inter-organizational data federations and, and networks. The mini Sentinel project of the Food and Drug Administration, so the so-called HMO Research Network, the Cancer Research Network, a new project called Cancer Link. There's a lot of interest in the cancer community uh, in, in this concept that represent a different kind of embryonic learning health system. These are mini learning health systems that consist of different organizations forming federations to share data and learn from their shared data. The federal government is beginning to get learning health system fever, and we're delighted to see that. Uh, the NIH has recognized this in part with its Big Data to Knowledge uh, initiative, for which uh, grant proposals were recently due. Uh, PCORI, which is, um, which is a nonprofit entity situated outside the government but, but receiving government support through the Affordable uh, Care Act, has just funded a whole set of patient-centered research networks, which themselves are many learning health systems, uh, or will be as they become mature. And the National Science Foundation Smart and Connected Health uh, Program has recognized the importance of the learning health system in a way that I'll describe in just a moment. Uh, there is also, and this is one of my activities that uh, JSB was uh, referring to in his kind introduction, a grassroots movement uh, growing, bringing together all the stakeholders with interest in the learning health system to be sure that this movement develops uh, in an even and multi-stakeholder way, grounded in a set of core values that were developed at a learning health system summit that was uh, held in May uh, 2012. And what is growing out of the summit is this grassroots movement, as I mentioned, called the learning health community. The key members of the learning health community are 56 organizations 
many of which you will recognize uh, from this slide, who have formally endorsed the Learning Health System core values, in other words, a set of principles upon which a national scale learning health system must rest, and are committed to seeing a learning health system develop in a way that is reflective of, of these core values. So we are making progress. We are approaching, I'm not sure how long it will take, but we are approaching. If you add the words to the learning islands, to the interorganizational data federations and networks, to the grant programs, to the, to the grassroots coalition of the willing, that learning health community I was talking about, that leads me at least to a high level of confidence that we will gradually approach a first national learning health system over time. That's the good news. The not so good news, which takes me to the second part of my talk, is a belief I also have that this first system is not going to be good enough to turn the Titanic. And that we need to set our sights on a much higher functioning version of the learning health system than what we will get from the evolution of these five factors you see on this slide, which takes me into the second course uh, of our menu here today. Beginning with, what are the features of a high functioning and sustainable learning health system? A system that is high enough functioning that it can turn the Titanic. Well, this question was in fact the focus of a workshop that was uh, supported by the National Science Foundation and that uh, took place in April of, I guess I have to say last year, uh, to do exactly that, to explore the research challenges, the research problems that actually have to be solved in order to achieve not this first system, but a much higher functioning system with, with, with the capability to actually carry out those proto-use cases that I described to you before, learning in real time the best dosage uh, of, of a drug, being able to alert clinicians when an epidemic is about to reach them, the implementation of a patients like me button which would enable any person in the country to say, okay, what has been the experience of people like me as a consequence of very difficult healthcare decisions uh, that they made in hopes that I can learn as, a per as an individual from their experience. This was an interdisciplinary workshop. There were 45 invited participants uh, whose backgrounds range from computer science to epidemiology, to economics. We had anthropologists there. Uh, a wide range of fields uh, were covered. And a report has been issued. Uh, you will have a copy of these slides. So uh, you will be able to, and I hope you will, uh, access the full report entitled Toward a Science of Learning Systems uh, from uh, the website uh, containing it. And on the bottom, I included some pictures. I hope you can see them in enough detail uh, to see the intensity, and it, and it really was incredible, the, the intensity uh, of the deliberations that took place over the two days of this meeting. It was concluded that a high-functioning learning health system would have to meet four what were termed system-level uh, requirements. It would have to be completely trusted and valued by all stakeholders. It would have to be economically sustainable and self-governing. Several of you out there, I'm sure, were asking yourself as I was talking and perhaps thinking I was naive, who's going to pay for this? That question is out there, and, and that question, of course, uh, needs to be addressed. Then there are a number of more technical uh, requirements of a high-functioning learning health system. It needs to be stable, rapidly functioning, certifiable, adaptable, and self-improving. And finally, probably not too surprising from the description I gave before, it's got to work. It's got to be capable of engendering 
virtuous cycles of health improvement so that things actually get better as a result of the learning health system being in operation. Now, our workshop ended up having findings at two levels. Both of them are important. One was what we were asked to do and what we, what we were expected would happen. We identified over the course of the workshop 106 research questions uh, organized into, into four categories and 19 subcategories that constitute the research agenda for realizing this high-functioning learning health system. The second outcome was not expected. It was something transcendent. And it was a vision of a science of learning health systems that is going to be necessary to address these questions and therefore achieve the learning health system. It became recognized by all 45 people uh, at this meeting that we need a new way of thinking about these problems in order to achieve the learning health system. Uh, I'm not going to read these for you. I'm just going to uh, run them past you on the slide and with luck tantalize you by them. Uh, these are just four examples, one under each category, one under each system level requirement of the questions that resulted from the workshop. This is the first kind of outcome. Uh, these are two of the 106 questions. Under uh, trust and value, there was a question uh, related to the properties of data uh, that will engender confidence and trust. A, under the system level requirement that the LHS be economically sustainable and self-governing, there was a question among many uh, re relating to uh, those ingredients essential to realizing an LHS that have no private rationale for funding and therefore must be funded from public sources. What is the public's role in realizing a learning health system versus uh, the private sector's role? We didn't answer this question at the workshop, of course. We just identified it as one of the 106. Under the system level requirement related to stability, rapid functioning, et cetera, there was a question relating to making data self-describing. So the system, this high functioning system, could function eventually without human intervention. And then related an example question related to the fourth system level requirement relating to capability to actually make things better. Uh, one question identified out of many was how do we build a learning health system that's smart enough to explain itself? Which brings me to the last part of my talk which is related to that second transcendent finding of the workshop, this notion of a science of learning systems that grew out of the workshop and uh, is perhaps the, the, the more important of the two sets of findings, but the 106 questions we hope will be very, very important in establishing a research agenda. I'm going to come at this from several different directions, and a couple of them will be analogical and historical. A lot of people, when they go around and talk about the learning health system, they talk about it as a moonshot. And every time they do that, I kind of cringe, because that isn't right. My understanding of what John F. Kennedy knew when he stood up in 1961 and said that the US would put a man on the moon uh, before the end of the decade is that he knew it was possible. He knew that no engineering breakthroughs were necessary to do this. We could, as in fact they did, pert out the whole process and basically see in 1961 pretty much what the roadmap or the pathway was going to be to get, put a man on the moon by 1969. So the learning health system is not a moonshot. It's much more than that. And frankly, in some quarters, one of the problems those of us who want to realize a national learning health system are facing is a significant opinion held by a very large number of people that let's get on with it. Let's just put it out. Let's create a big project plan and let's build the thing. And 
I and many others believe, and certainly those who attended this NSF workshop believe, you can't do it that way. It is not a moonshot. It is, in fact, more like the Panama Canal. And uh, those of you who uh, read a lot of history may recall that the French built the Suez Canal, and they built it very easily because basically the Suez Canal was just a ditch in the desert. It had no locks, and basically they dug a ditch, and the water flowed in from both sides, and poof, instant canal. Well, history tells us that they tried to build the Panama Canal the same way, uh, using the same methods, and they failed miserably. And that's because they didn't frame the problem correctly. They didn't see that they had to approach building the Panama Canal very, very differently. The French failed. The Americans came in a few years later and undertook to build the Panama Canal, but they took what wasn't called then, but what we would call now a socio-technical approach to building uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, the picture you see now is the, is the finished canal. Some of the problems they had to solve were technical. Not only did they need locks to build the Panama Canal through mountainous territory, they needed locks of unprecedented size and technological sophistication. So certainly building the Panama Canal was a technical problem. But it was also a socio-biological problem. One of the reasons the French failed is that most of the workers contracted and died from yellow fever. So in order to build the Panama Canal, they had to find a form of immunization, a vaccine that would immunize people against yellow fever. So they had to solve that problem too. And finally, uh, when they built the Panama Canal, when they started to build the Panama Canal, they realized the government of what is now the country of Panama at the time, uh, which was Colombia, Panama was part of Colombia, uh, was not particularly supportive of the canal uh, being built through their country. Uh, one might question the, the political motivations that created this, but in point of fact, it was necessary not only to achieve new feats of engineering, not only to conquer a deadly infectious disease, but actually to create an entire new nation, breaking Panama off from Colombia in order to realize the Panama Canal. We have to think of the learning health system more like the Panama Canal than a moonshot, or we will fail like the French did when the French tried to build the Panama Canal using old methods that had worked for them on a different problem but won't work for this one. So the transcendent workshop product that I credit the three folks at the bottom of the slide uh, with really uh, bringing to light, uh, you may know some of these people, Kevin Sullivan from the University of Virginia, uh, Bill Stead uh, from Vanderbilt, and Doug Van Howling uh, from my own institution uh, in Michigan were uh, these folks were instrumental in, in uh, raising this idea, and then it was uh, really developed and perfected by uh, the, the entire group. This product was a recognition that the learning health system, because of the kind of problem it is, makes the irrefutable case for a science of what the report calls cyber social ecosystems, which will inevitably be a science of learning systems. And, and, and this science that we, that we don't have in its entirety right now, we have pieces of it, is a science that will propound fundamental principles to enable design, analysis, construction, as it says here, governance, operation, and evolution of ultra-large scale systems like the learning health system that deeply integrate information and physical phenomena. The report goes on as reflective of what was discussed in the meeting. Uh, to characterize some key precepts of this science of cyber social ecosystems relating to complex information processes that will be affected by networks of people, institutions, and machinery, systems that carry out large-scale computations uh, 
will do this in an environment where the components think about the different stakeholders in the healthcare system in order to stay in business. They operate, each one operates in their own self interest. The learning health system will bring them together. They will have to work together, but that won't change the fact that the learning health system will be a system of entities, each of which operates in its own self-interest. We, we need a way of understanding those dynamics that we don't have now. And finally, of the example precepts that are listed here, the system as a whole, not just the digital infrastructure, but also the people and these institutions uh, will have to be understood as intrinsic parts uh, of the system. If we don't attend to these things, we might realize a first system, but that first system won't be the system that turns the Titanic. It will be a system that is built on principles uh, such as those uh, listed here and the research agenda that is spawned from the set of principles. As I draw to a close, I, I can't emphasize enough that this is mission critical. The, the uh, cyber social perspective and the research agenda, agenda it generates must drive the achievement of the, L, of the LHS. There are some key implications of, of how I think we will need to proceed, things you will observe in the development of the learning health system if we are being true to these precepts. Uh, we will see an evolutionary approach rather than a kind of waterfall uh, build-out approach. We will see explicit design of a system that is capable of uh, adapting itself uh, to changing circumstances. We will see an explicit embracing of the fractal property of the learning health system and research into and ultimately insights about how to build this system up to higher levels of scale out of components that have been successful at lower levels of scale. We will see an approach that is simultaneously attentive to all parts of that virtuous cycle, giving equal attention to the aggregation and analysis of data and the feedback and change aspects of the process that result from the feedback of that data. We'll see attention to all of the domains of application that the learning health system as a single platform uh, is capable of. Healthcare, empowerment, public health, research. We will not build four Brooklyn bridges to carry four different kinds of traffic. We will build one to carry all four. And we will, in order to make a self uh, sustaining and governable system uh, do this in a way that from the outset engages all stakeholders. As I have been at this meeting and enjoyed participating in many of the sessions and begun to appreciate the full range of, of, of viewpoints and, and, and insights and perspectives that are captured at this meeting, I am doubly delighted to have been invited to this meeting because I see such a natural union between the perspectives that are captured by the Hicks system science community as a whole and the problems that need to be solved if we are going to be successful in realizing this learning health system, achieving um, something that will improve health in this country, turn the Titanic, and solve this grand challenge. So in sum, our health system is headed directly for the iceberg. I hope I convinced you of that. Perhaps you knew it already. Second point, a high functioning learning health system, a single multi-purpose infrastructure. I have asserted and increasingly it is being believed is what can turn the Titanic and third, getting to the second part of our two-course menu here, uh, it's becoming increasingly clear if we're not going to fail the way the French failed to build the Suez Canal, uh, build the way the French failed to build the Panama Canal, uh, we are going to need guidance from this new science of cyber-social ecosystem as a framing perspective. 
and solution to the research questions that it generates to achieve that high-functioning learning health system that will be required to turn the Titanic. Uh, thank you very much. I very much appreciate the chance to have uh, spoken with you here today. I think we have time for questions. I hope you have questions. If you have no questions, I have failed miserably. <laughs> Just to save you from being miserable, thank you very much for the inspiring talk, and I really appreciate you know, the effort that you put into uh, creating such an initiative. My question would be, you had the metaphor of the Titanic several times. What if? The metaphor is actually coming true, meaning that the Titanic will sink. What is our plan B? Some of us will die, some of us will live on. What's the plan B for the time after the Titanic has sunk? Well, are, are you the person who asked um, the secretary about a nuclear holocaust? Or, or was that someone else? Uh, uh, seriously, uh, we're all trying to keep this from happening. Obviously, if the, 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 no metaphor is perfect, and uh, if we uh, hit the iceberg uh, metaphorically, that corresponds to a process that will unfold over a long period of time. It will not be a single cataclysmic event, such as the sinking of the Titanic. Uh, Many people believe, and I'm venturing out of my area of expertise here, that uh, this will basically be the end of the U.S. Uh, as the dominant economy uh, in the world. If the fraction of the GDP, particularly as the population of this country uh, ages, uh, uh, continues to grow, and as President Clinton pointed out in his talk, uh, this will sap resources from so many other uh, segments uh, of the economy. It will be the end of the, pro of the historic uh, prosperity uh, uh, of this nation. Uh, we will also continue and we will just tolerate hundreds of thousands of people dying of medical errors. Uh, many, many uh, infants um, dying who, as is demonstrated by other countries, uh, do not need uh, to have their lives cut short in that way. So it won't be, it won't be a single cataclysm, it will be a gradual thing, uh, but in its, uh, in its symbolic magnitude, the Titanic is etched into all of our memories, it, it will be of the same order of magnitude. Thank you. Yes, hi Chuck, uh, great talk. Uh, talking about the learning system almost begs a rhetorical question of what is the learning theory? Or to be a little bit more specific, uh, you know, I mean, organizations learn all the time. One could say that the current healthcare system has learned to organize around reimbursement systems or something like that. Uh, so. What is different here? Is, is it more information in terms of double loop learning? Is it changing the incentive patterns around patient uh, wellness? You know, what, what's the different learning to occur, I guess, is a question. Thank you. Well, I'm tempted to say you answered, the, you answered your own question, Tom. It, it, it's the ability to put our data to work. We've, we've always believed in the principles of organizational learning. They have been around uh, forever. They were formalized perhaps 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, but these principles have always been with us, that we can learn from experience. What we have been unable to do in this country is to do this efficiently and to do it, uh, and to do it at scale. So I think, I, I, I think the principle here is not a new principle of learning, but rather an application of, of that principle so that things that were very, very difficult, very, very clunky, too slow, can be done more easily, 
uh, more efficiently and more quickly. There's a major problem with the cycle time of the virtuous cycles that we're capable of now. We have many virtuous cycles in place, for example, randomized clinical trials, but they're too slow. And very often we find ourselves in a circumstance where the problem has changed by the time we have the answer and we've studied an old problem and you can't catch up uh, that way. So we don't need a new theory. Uh, we need a new infrastructure to implement a theory we've had for a long time, in my opinion. Yes. Hi, Chuck. I uh, enjoyed the chat. Um, uh, my name is Mike Doan. My question for you is um, we're seeing a, uh, an increase in uh, tech entrepreneurs. I'm wondering if you see a role uh, for technology entrepreneurs in the learning health system and uh, what that role is. Thank you. Oh, a great question and, and, and thank you. Let's begin with the 106 research uh, questions. Uh, I, I think we are going to need uh, the kind of out-of-the-box thinking uh, that this entrepreneur uh, community uh, represents. Uh, startup firms that will not only do research but will develop uh, pioneering technology uh, to make this work. I think without that spirit, uh, this can't happen. I'm very reluctant to start talking about healthcare.gov and uh, the uh, nation's uh, procurement, uh, uh, the government's uh, procurement process that led in part uh, uh, to, that, uh, to that debacle. Uh, we need a whole new approach to this work, and I think that whole new approach to this work will emanate largely uh, from from that community, and uh, I, I can't emphasize the importance of that enough. This is sort of, I'm, I'm Eric Clemens, and I tend to be annoying. Uh, I have a, a simple sort of contrarian question. I don't think it contradicts you, but I think it's, it's a compliment that you haven't addressed. Uh, this is among the most educated audience in the world, and we actually do know a lot about health, and I'd like us all to look at ourselves and say how many of us can still wear the suit we wore after our college graduation? How many of us are unaware of the relationship between obesity and heart disease, or obesity and type 2 diabetes? And how many of us have done nothing about it? So I think there are massive, massive human problems, uh, individual problems, not physician problems, that lead to, the, for instance, the mortality statistic you showed. I think it's massively, massively skewed. And if you were to take a look at, um, at, at death rates among married white women's children, as opposed to the population as a whole, you would see that the problem isn't just with our healthcare system, it's with the execution of it. And what I'd really like to see is how this mates to that, how this matches to that. Thank you for your patience, and it oh, was a great talk. Uh, thank you, that's not, that's not contrarian at all, and uh, if your goal was to be annoying, you failed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, in, in response to your excellent point, let me make a couple of uh, observations. Uh, first of all, in, in these virtuous cycle learning loops, the, I gave an example where an organization was the learning entity, but just as easily an individual can be the learning entity. So if obesity and the reduction of obesity is the problem we are trying to solve, that learn, the learning health system and, the, and a virtuous cycle directed at that problem, putting data to work, giving feedback, in this case to people, using uh, well uh, thought through theories of behavioral change, uh, can address that problem uh, just as well. Second observation, uh, disparities. Enormous problem in this country, and you correctly pointed out. I think the learning health system and the ability it creates of our nation's health system to study itself can cast these disparities in an entirely new light because once again, because we don't have the system wired together into a learning health system. And I saw this inside the government. It takes us too long to understand what's going on. 
And we also um, understand what's going on with data that often can be called into question, not that any source of data is perfect, but I think with our wired together learning health system that enables real-time study of ourselves, issues like disparity will emerge in a clearer and much more unrefutable, uh, irrefutable light which will require a, an enlightened society to do something about it in a way that may not be the case now. Maybe I have my head in the clouds, but those are two observations I would make. Yeah. Uh, Peter Lowe, Saarland University, Germany. Thanks a lot for your uh, presentation, and I think it's the right idea to bring the health system forward, and it's not only true for the US, it's also true for Germany, I can say. Um, you clearly stated that you need the involvement of all stakeholders. Um, I wonder about the commitment of all the stakeholders um, because um, some of the stakeholders, they live uh, from an ill uh, society, not from a healthy society. So concrete, the question is, is there already uh, involvement and a commitment from all, from old, uh, all stakeholders? Um, maybe some companies have a hidden agenda uh, if they fr uh, fret by such a big project and wish. So how do you stand with your project or vision? Uh, great question. Uh, I am a bit and have been called uh, a bit of an optimist and a, and a Pollyanna about this. But the experience of that summit in May 2012, which did in fact bring all the stakeholders together and brought them to consensus on a set of non-trivial core values underlying a learning health system leads me to believe that while there are a very large number of problems to solve, uh, in the end, all of these st stakeholders will come to realize uh, that we are all better off with a healthier population, a safer healthcare system, and a lower uh, GDP footprint of health uh, uh, in this country. If that were not the case, these organizations would not have attended this meeting and they would, n this summit meeting that I described, and they would not have uh, signed on uh, to these core values. The learning health system will be built in an evolutionary fashion and it will be built starting with those who believe. And if it works well, as I think it will, it will grow from that core and it will accrue additional members, additional stakeholders who recognize its value. The key to the success of this model will be that at any given time, a subset of each stakeholder group is represented. There can't be any group entirely missing. That's an airplane that won't fly. But the summit I described leads me to believe, and what has happened after the summit leads me to believe, that we can begin uh, with significant representation of all the stakeholders in this initial system. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Ashley Aitken from Australia here. I'm wondering whether you talk about a US focus here. I wonder whether um, any experiences in more socially driven health systems uh, centralized more in other countries like Australia and uh, European countries, whether they have any uh, learning aspects to their health systems and whether you can learn from them or, or what? Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Well, I'm delighted that the European community, as one example, uh, has caught learning health system fever. Uh, and, and the European Commission has seen fit to uh, put some money uh, into that venture. There's a program ongoing now called Transform, uh, 16 or 18 million uh, euros invested specifically in the learning health, in a learning health system for Europe as a target goal. And if you look at the five trends that I described in the evolution or the or, uh, in the evolution toward a first version of a learning health system for the US, you did not see anything like transform uh, in that. So, so what the European community has done is something that has not happened in this country, and I wish would happen in this country, is that some entity with resources basically targets the whole problem 
and puts those resources into an effort which would address the whole problem um, at scale uh, as a goal. So uh, I, I can't speak directly to Australia. Uh, I, I, I know there are great things happening in Australia relating to uh, inspired application of health information technology. I would be surprised if there weren't some uh, small pockets of learning health system fever there as well. Yes. Sir Arvenpaa, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, early one of the slides you had just enough standardization. Can you elaborate on that? And from which of the stakeholders' point of view? Because it seems that just enough standardization would be very different from the different uh, stakeholder. Okay, great, great question. I, I, I flashed that slide past you and uh, did not elaborate on it, so I'm very glad you brought that up. There is a belief uh, among many in this community that we really need to follow the model of the internet uh, and the hourglass model uh, of the narrow neck of the funnel uh, as, uh, as a way to be successful in building a learning health system. We need to ensure that there can be innovation at the edges, but at the same time, we need that narrow neck really, really torqued down in the sense analogous to TCP IP. So uh, that's almost becoming an axiomatic belief among learning health system thinkers. There is actually an initiative underway now called ESTEL, uh, Essential Standards to Enable Learning, which is specifically focused on identifying what is the TCP IP for the learning health system. What is that minimum set of standards which will enable the system to work? These could be both transport standards and representational standards. Uh, while allowing innovation around those standards in the way that has made the internet uh, so successful. If you write to me, I can give you more details uh, about that. Thank you. Thank you.